The last thing you want to do is all that work and be ready to pour a slab and you can't get an inspection for two weeks. I got taught early on in my business career that no matter how good you are, you're never too good for a checklist. That was back when I worked at McDonald's. I'm now running a building company and the same philosophy applies to building homes. So we've created a bunch of checklists, slab down, frames up, roof on, pre-clad, pre-lined. And we've put these videos together to give you an insight into how we approach each phase of the build. Quick disclaimer, these aren't the only way to build. I think it's important for everyone just to be on the same page within one company. By no means am I an expert, and this is just our approach to each phase of the build. On every one of my site checklists, we have a prepare stage, and this is things you can do before you even get to site, before you even start doing the work. If we're putting a slab down, we probably haven't really done any work on site yet. So to prepare, we'd order the portaloo, we'd make sure there's power on site, we'd make sure there's running water. We'd print the plans, read them, book in a pile driver if required. You know, usually those guys need two to three weeks notice. You'd confirm that your survey set out has been done. You've seen me set up my own house before, and a builder can do it, but we've made the decision to get a surveyor to set out every one of our builds. It means it's bang on, it means that we've got the heights right, we've got the locations right. As our sites get tighter and tighter, that is more important. The other reason we do this is sometimes we start building the house before the boundaries are even put in place. Again, using a surveyor means that this doesn't stuff up the subdivision process. We'll also book in our inspections. It may be different where you are, but where we are, sometimes you can be anywhere from two to four weeks out with the council inspections. The last thing you wanna do is all that work and be ready to pour a slab and you can't get an inspection for two weeks. So we plan it out, we work out when we need our council inspections, when do we need our engineer inspections, and we pencil those in. You need to book your plumber because, again, you can do all your work, but you don't want to be held up by your plumber doing his subfloor drains. And then we give our concrete placer a call and we see what their timeline's like. And the last thing we do at the pre-operation stage is we book the next phase of work. Booking frames needs about four weeks. So you want to be doing this prepare stage about two weeks before you actually want to do any action on site. That not only prepares the slab stage, but it means that the frames are rolling and kicks off the whole build on a really good note. That prep stage can be real hard for a builder who's on site. They just want to be busy doing some action. But if you don't stop and carve out half a day to prep that job that's happening in four weeks, you're going to be chasing your tail the whole way. So you've done all your prep work and it's two weeks later, now you're on site, you can establish your profiles. First step of establishing profiles is to get your datum height. We've had our surveyor in, or we've got our topographical plan and we establish a datum. So first thing we'll do is find the datum and we'll decide that is the site datum from now on. Make sure it's real obvious, spray it green, orange, something. That's what you're gonna to have to use a few times throughout the build. The datum is now the site height that everything else is in relation to. And so FFL, finished floor level, will be in relation to the datum and the datum will be in relation to MSL, median sea levels. Basically, how high is your land up or down from sea level? And that's something that a bunch of surveyors and I don't know, Linz or someone has agreed on. And we just follow that. For example, the datum could be like 99.4. That means it's 99 meters above sea level. And then the slab could be 100.4. That means the slab, if it fell, is one meter above the datum. The next thing I'd do is establish the four corners of the build, and I'd peg these out or spray them, but you just kind of want to get approximately this is where the building is going. We now mark a meter off, and we put our profiles in all four corners, and we put them to the height of our FFL, or our datum height. So you've put your profiles up, and the next thing you're going to do is go ahead and click subscribe and help us build up this channel. So believe it or not, the first thing we do before we build a house is we string the house out. 
String lines are amazing for visualizing, right, this is the height of the slab and this is the dimensions of the slab. And so you get your build working perfectly with string. So you string up the exteriors, then you check that it's square, then you lock in those string lines with double nails. So the way a double nail is a nail on this side of the string and a nail on this side of the string and then the string goes through the middle and then you spray it. Now, everyone else from that point onwards knows that that is the building line, BL. As you tweak the building, your string line moves along the profiles. You could adjust it five, 10 times. Once you've locked it in, you wanna make sure that that's your line that you're following from now on. Make it clear that the final is the final. Remove any doubt. So we've locked in our building lines, now our plumber can use the building lines to get his subfloor drains in, and now we can start our final layer of sand. Obviously all of this is assuming that you've done your site works first, that someone's come in and done a cut and a prep and a base course. So profiles are finished, plumber's done, it's time to move on to the formwork. Formwork, we sometimes call it boxing, basically it's a temporary surface that you put in place while your concrete is setting. So you'd lay the formwork at the edge of the slab, your concrete comes up to it, it's gotta be nice and rigid and strong, and it's gotta stay in place until the concrete has gone hard. It's gotta be not only at the right line of the concrete, but it's gonna be at the right height, because the concrete places come along the top of the formwork, and that's what they use to get the height of the slab. Like all of these phases, you want to come up with a bit of a system. You pick a corner, you go around, you lay your ground plate. You start laying out your lengths and using your offcuts wisely. Your ground plate is the bottom board that holds the formwork in place. So lay all your lengths out temporarily, approximately right according to the building line. Now you've got your string line and you can level down using an offcut of boxing you now can offset and make sure your ground plate is mint the whole way along the building line. So work your way around the exterior of the building. See how you're always referring back to your string line that you set up. So if that's not correct, everything else flows on. Yo, if you're enjoying these checklist videos and you want a copy for your business or your site, head to nzbuilder.co.nz slash checklist to find out more information. So as you're straightening your ground plate, you're putting a, either a waratah or a peg or a brace, depending what you're bracing back to, every 600 to a meter. We prefer to go 600. Basically, you want to eliminate any movement in the formwork. There is a lot of pressure in wet concrete. While you're pouring the concrete and while it's setting is not the time to find out that you haven't put enough pegs in. So once you've done your ground plate, depending on the system you're using, you could either do your jack frame. So you lay your ground plate, you go around and you shoot a bunch of jack studs, you put a top plate in, you straighten that up. We have now switched to using 300 mil wide boards that are 32 mil thick, and we've gone and made a bunch of steel braces. So that eliminates the need to build a jack frame, eliminates waste. So two different ways you can do it. A great example of the jack frame is the one I used on the section nobody wanted. I did this for a couple of reasons. It was the height of the formwork. On the steeper side of the section, it was 600 mils out of the ground. And I was just using up leftover materials. Now that we have multiple jobs on the go and I've got a crew, I've invested a bunch of money in formwork and braces. So we would start bracing up the formwork using our steel braces. The fourth stage is to do your pods and steel. We've now got our formwork in place and it is to the correct line, it is plumb, and it is to the correct height. So we can actually remove the string lines now and we can start working off the formwork. The very next thing we do is lay polythene. So polythene is the big black plastic sheets that stop the rising damp coming up out of the ground. We would make sure we follow the specs to tape any laps and we would also seal around any penetrations like pipes. From here we would start laying out our pods or if you're doing a traditional 3604 slab, you would just start doing your footings. 
Uh, it's important to note this checklist is assuming that the majority of our jobs now are rib raft slabs. You can follow this same process for a 3604 slab. After laying your ground plate, you would start digging your footing, then you would build your jack frame, then you'd move on to doing your cages. So start laying out the pods, make sure you follow the pattern that the engineer or the designer has specified in the foundation design. They may have allowed for special thickenings or concrete beams in certain places to take extra load. You can then start laying all your steel out, you can tie all that together. Now's the time where you need to book in your final inspections. The council will want to come along and see that you've done the polythene properly. The engineer will want to come along and see that you've used the correct amount of steel in the right places you can now book a pour date. And I've put an important note here that I've learned the hard way, inform the neighbors. Just knock on the door and say, hey, guess what? Tomorrow we've got a concrete truck and a concrete pump and about five tradies all turning up. It's gonna be a lot of action. It's probably gonna happen at 7 a.m. Just letting you know. Technically, you don't have to tell them, but it's way easier to resolve any neighborly issues before they happen than deal with grumpy neighbors who can't get out of their driveways, who are running late for work. Trust me, I've dealt with it all and I've learned the hard way. We've poured the slab, we've allowed enough time for it to go hard, at least 24 hours, ideally a little bit more. This is a time where you can mark your saw cuts and get the concrete cut yourself or book in a concrete cutter. Saw cuts are put in the top of the slab to allow for any cracking, but as concrete dries, it shrinks and you want to put in control joints, you are attempting to direct the cracks down those joints. You'd remove your boxing, you'd tidy this all up as you're removing it. You'd have some buckets to put all your screws in, put all your braces in nice piles, or even better, as you're pulling it all off, put it straight back on the trailer, bring it straight back to the yard or wherever it's gonna live, because most likely you're not gonna need it on that building site again. And rather than double, triple handling it, you might as well get rid of it at this point. This is one really important aspect. It's real easy to rush on to the next stage without tying up the loose ends from the last stage. So we've deboxed, we can now mark our grid lines and we can get ready for frame delivery. Yo, if you're enjoying these checklist videos and you want a copy for your business or your site, head to nzbuilder.co.nz slash checklist to find out more information.